Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. Uh, welcome to our panel of the Research and Innovation Strategy Group of the University of South Africa. We have an esteemed panel of research and innovation management leaders in our higher education sector who help us as a continent, as a country and as individuals to connect to the rest of the world and to grapple with management of research for impact. My name is Tandi Mkwebi. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation and Internationalization at Nelson Mandela University. Our session is about research impact and we'll come to that just now. In this session, we aspire to highlight to you that research impact is real change in the real world. There are many different kinds of impact that can be achieved. And these range from attitudinal, from awareness, economic, social, policy, cultural, and health, and anything you can think of. So there are many definitions that have been put forward by various funding bodies, by universities, and by researchers alike. And uh, we'll probably hear about these uh, during our session. We also noticed that it takes enormous amount of hard work and persistence to create impact from research. Impact is achieved through several steps that include relevant audiences in society to connect with, to discover, to understand, and advocate for research and directly advocate for science. And I do dare say that impact is best achieved through stakeholder engagement. You may have noticed yourselves that national assessment programs and funding agencies nowadays are placing increased emphasis on dissemination and impact evaluation, particularly outside of academia. So researchers will need to develop new skills and capabilities to demonstrate ability to create impact, which could become central to career progression and institutional reputation. Already so, we have seen discussions and new measures for institutional rankings, which focus on research impact, directly affecting perceptions and reputation. So the format of this session is I will introduce the contributors to the session. Uh, prior to that, I will be inviting the chair of the Research and Innovation Strategy Group, Professor Toko Maegiso, to speak to us about this session and perhaps what we would like to achieve as USAF in this session. And after that, I will introduce the panels, the panelists. Over to you, Professor Maegiso. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mwebi. Uh, afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to the session on research impact. And thank you, Dr. Mwebi, for those introductory remarks. Research impact has been identified as one of the priorities of the USAF Research and Innovation Strategy Group for the past three years or so and will continue to be a priority in 2022. As we all know, research is an expensive undertaking, particularly setting up the requisite infrastructure for high-end research. Over the past decade or so, increasing accountability demands are being placed on government departments and agencies funding bodies and research management at various levels in justifying the outputs arising from the financial investments. For a long time, the primary indicator as a measurement of success was scholarly excellence in output. However, with ever increasing calls for universities and research facilities and science councils to strengthen their relationship with wider society, the set of indicators have widened to reflect transparency of benefits beyond science excellence. 
One of the questions posed by the Minister Nzimande in the morning was, how can we maximize and scale up the impact of our universities in the economy? At the same time, Professor McCowan cautioned us also earlier today about what he termed the perils of impact. This session is therefore aimed to provide us with the multidimensional aspects or approaches to research impacts. And that is why we have today a, a diverse panel, which will then approach this very important topic from different perspectives. I'm looking forward to insightful deliberations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maegi. So now to introduce my panelists, I'm not going to read their biographies and they are available on the website, but also you can read their biographies uh, from the program. And um, I'm just going to indicate the order of the speakers. We have Dr. Fulufelo Nelwamondo, who is the CEO of the National Research Foundation, will be speaking first, and then will be followed by Professor Lynn Morris, who's the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of the Witwatersrand, and followed by Dr. McLean Sibanda. I'm handing over to you, uh, Dr. Nelwamondo. Thank you. So thank you. Yes, I hope you can, yes, we can see my, my presentation. <clears throat> I won't repeat what has been said, but I think everyone is very much aware of the challenges that South Africa is facing. Um, and these are the challenges that are not necessarily South African. Um, I think all the funding agencies everywhere in the world are facing similar challenges. There's no doubt that because of this, we all need to make tough decisions in terms of where do we invest uh, our research funds and uh, what should be the new criteria for selecting such kind of uh, investments. Um, if you listen to what we just had over the last few uh, weeks, um, 86,000 people lost their jobs in the, first in the last quarter. We have had uh, unemployment rates uh, rising to the levels that are the highest since the dawn of democracy. And because of this, the funding of research has always been uh, a challenge in a sense that uh, in the current form, we always hear of declining funding uh, of research, not only in South Africa, but everywhere in the world. It is in this context that we need to then win the trust of the public, that the research that we are doing is gonna make their lives better. They should be convinced that, as opposed to you giving me a grant uh, today, a social grant, I'm better off with this money being invested in research such that in a year's time or in two years time, I will then have a better livelihood. So with that in mind, the NRF developed a new framework, which has been uh, titled the framework to advance societal and knowledge impact of research. And this is a work that has been uh, developed over the last one and a half years. Uh, I know I have about 15 minutes to summarize this work. So it's gonna be a very uh, quick, drive over my, my slides. But just to add maybe one element before I get into the presentation itself, the key elements of our vision uh, going forward talks to the four elements of transformation, of impact, of excellence, and sustainability. And this element talks largely to the second part, which is the impact. In terms of the presentation itself, uh, I will share the process and the timelines, the rationale for the impact agenda, the basic principles that have been adopted, what the actual definition of impact uh, is, and the impact pathways, and the aspect around assessment. How do we actually evaluate and assess this uh, impact? And of course, this will have implications, which I will touch on uh, in saying what are the implications for the NRF and the science system uh, as a whole going forward. As I mentioned, this is a work that has been uh, ongoing for the last one and a half years. Uh, it started in May 2020, 
where there was a task team appointed, uh, guided by the reference group. Uh, this task team managed to develop the um, draft framework, which was completed in December 2020. And the bulk of this year, 2021, has largely been focusing on uh, consultations with various stakeholders. There was an external task team that was developed, chaired by Professor Ahmed Bauer, and it had members from various science councils in the universities. And consultations were held, and a final draft was developed. And it is in this context that I'll be sharing uh, what this actually means for the system going forward. So just to start, what, why do we need this impact agenda? Why is this necessary? The key aspect is that the investment in research should produce impacts, both within the knowledge enterprise and for societal benefits. Further to this, if you look at the mandate of the NRF, um, it emphasizes the contribution to national development. And we have actually put this clearly in our uh, vision 2030. That talks largely to the research for better society. That talks about enabling and facilitating contribution of knowledge and scientific research to national development. The white paper on science, technology, and innovation and the decadal plan also talk largely to contributing to society uh, or research uh, contributing to society and to national development. And it is in that context that this becomes something that is uh, of uh, utmost importance to be considered. There are a few principles that we had to consider and adopt and say, these are the principles that as much as we move towards this impact framework, we cannot compromise. The first one is transformation. Transformation is a critical element and is a desired outcome of the impact agenda. The minister spoke at, lang at length about transformation and we're talking about transformation uh, perhaps in a, in a wider definition than just uh, demographic transformation. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the details now. The second one talks to the research impact not being predictable. And this was raised in a number of conversations since this morning. We know that it's difficult to know what impact your research is gonna make. We know that research uh, impact might not be time bound and it is not always achieved through a sequential process. So we may not know how it's gonna fall. Three, scientific rigor remains fundamental. Of course, if your work is not, uh, if there's no excellence in it, we won't really expect uh, impact to come from it. So excellence remains a fundamental principle that we are saying that's not gonna be compromised. Engage in collaborative research is a very key aspect, and we see those as enablers for uh, impact to be realized. The other issue which is very critical is that impact will need to be pursued across all fields, across all disciplines, and across all areas, uh, and across all the methods, because it cannot just be for one area. We have to look at uh, getting all the areas to start working together and making sure that the impact is a joint effort that cuts across all the areas. Assessment again, which is a key aspect because this is a very difficult aspect. It has to be multimodal, uh, considering what is now termed responsible research assessment. And I'm not gonna get into that today, but that's something that I think one can look at and say, how will this assessment be done? And the other aspect that's critical is that we value the fact that the nature of impact can differ over time uh, before you start your research, while you're doing the research and at the end of the research. But it is very important that the monitoring and evaluation occurs throughout all those processes, throughout all those stages of the project implementation. If I just jump to what the impact framework aims to achieve, um, the first part is that it determines or it establishes how the NRF through its core mandate areas will advance uh, uh, um, the impact for research by providing within the definition the context relevant interpretation of what impact is, the high level impact pathways, and the types of assessments that are required. Again, the framework uh, looks into um, the implementation guidelines across the various operational areas of the NRF. So if we just jump quickly to the, to the definition and uh, the program director started to the definition and it's, it's very much the same definition where we are saying the impact is defined as a beneficial change in society or knowledge advancement, which is brought about as a direct or indirect result of the NRF's research 
uh, and the support of those interventions, whether they were planned or, un uh, or unplanned, whether they're immediate or they're long-term, but the beneficial change in society becomes the guiding principle. Of course, this talks to two elements of impact, one being societal impact and the one being knowledge impact. So social impact talks about value, and I'm not gonna get into the definition now, but value from a social element, from the economic element, from environmental uh, side and others. It talks of innovation, which I believe uh, my colleague McLean will talk about. It talks about technological advancements, the policy developments, and the both are in the relationship between research and the improvement in the quality of uh, lives of people. Knowledge impact on the other side, is all about the scientific advances and understanding and the interpretation of the methods, theory, and other aspects. So if we look into the pathways, and I'll just use this diagram to summarize uh, this, and I'm not gonna get into the details because of time. We see this being maybe in four elements, where you have the input space, where you look into all the resources that we're investing. And here we can talk about how the research is done, how the planning is done, we have activities that come in. And here we can talk about your collaborations. We can talk about any aspect of application of the knowledge which sort of take place after uh, these inputs have been put in place. The outputs, the normal uh, research outputs that you can talk of, policy briefs, publications, you can name it. I'm not gonna go to them. And the outcomes become the applications or what is becoming or coming out from the usage of these outputs that are coming from here. And the impacts will then talk to that bigger definition of the beneficial change to society. When you look into these, you can see that there's an element that we, we are calling ex ante, which is the before. And at the particular stage, we must then be able to predict or to, uh, to assume the value that this work is gonna make uh, as the impact. And of course, when we look into the activities and the outputs, this is where the implementation takes place. And we then will assess whether indeed we are moving along this, uh, that stage. And the aspect that comes at the end talks to the ex post, which is post this element that we have control. This is a space where we have influence. We need to look at, you know, uh, is the impact coming now? Is it coming down, you know, five years down the line? But you can sort of just being, be able to observe whether that research is actually making impact. When you look into these aspects from the NRF point of view, there are parts that fall within the sphere of control the areas that fall within the sphere of influence, which is more the outputs, uh, the area where we just have interest because this is something that is down the line. I'm not gonna get into the details now. So in terms of the assessment, the assessment, I spoke about the ex ante, where we're saying, this is at the stage that somebody's putting a proposal into, into, into a place, but they must then be able to demonstrate that if you put funds here, I can tell you what will be the potential impact of my research or of this project. Of course, this calls for a big change. It will require a new suite of uh, funding instruments and programs that will have different weightings uh, for various criteria, where we need to balance these against, you know, what is the internet impact? Uh, are we, do we want collaborations? Do we want, you know, to attract new skills? Recording in progress. And all other aspects that we need to then look into. At the same time, as Recording I stopped. Earlier, impact cannot be predicted. And because of these, it makes more sense for RAS to push for a mindset change across all elements of research. Post or ex post, the NRF will focus on demonstrating impact through case studies and the relevant indicators, where we can say, look at this particular outcome is because of the work that we have, uh, we have funded or it's because of the investment that was made down the line. But of course, as I said earlier, monitoring and evaluation will need to occur uh, across all elements of the pathway. You know, we need to then be able to uh, uh, monitor and evaluate between inception until completion. Assessment at the same time will be carried out along the five areas, inputs all the way to the impact space. Um, the high level implications for this uh, is that of course, and I'm not gonna get into the details because of time. This talks about policy coherence, where we need to, ad to adjust our policies. It talks about our rewards and incentive schemes, where we are saying we must recognize impact and impact pathways. And of course, some of the system will then need to be changed to accommodate that. For uh, one case in point could be looking into the NRF rating system to say, how do we then embed the aspect of NRF of impact within the NRF rating? 
issues of improving impact literacy, you know, across all the NRF uh, employees and systems, across all the researchers within, within the system, the NSI and everywhere else. Partnerships and agreements need to then reflect our focus on impact. And these will require serious assessment of the potential impact and established uh, impact along the way with end users working together with the scientists. Of course, this uh, again becomes a game changer because we are not used to sort of working with the end users of who's going to be the beneficiary of this uh, uh, research, but bringing that uh, into the picture. Again, enablers of impact coming in where we need to consider how do we enable societal impact through promoting mission oriented interdisciplinary and engaged research throughout all the parts of uh, the funding system. Of course, this has uh, implementation considerations and challenges. And this is my last slide. But one particular aspect is that at the input stage, we need to then put new funding instruments with different weightings, uh, uh, understanding what the purpose that we really want to achieve. But the key aspect is that we need to then drive a way where we will ensure that research can embed the pathways that I spoke about in their research design from the beginning and being able to provide statement for potential impact, uh, what will uh, training for researchers and the impact literacy be in this particular project. Co-creation is a very critical aspect, as I mentioned. This talks about interaction with the end users from the beginning, because we can't just be doing the research that is not gonna benefit society. Noting that this could be very difficult to predict. Evaluation panels within our system obviously need to then change as well. Changing in a sense that we might need to actually think of how do we actually bring end users themselves to be members of the panel as well, where they can advise whether indeed this can solve the problems in my society or in my space. Within the other areas, activity stage, I've mentioned this, we need to monitor this effectively, uh, measuring whether indeed the impact pathway is being achieved or we're following uh, uh, things that we have promised that impact is gonna be. Output stage and the outcomes in the impact stage, we need to look into the post-grant reporting requirements to say you could have been funded now, but five years down the line, can you report on the impact given that we may not be able to know how long it's gonna take for your research to make impact. And again, this is not saying fundamental research is not important, but we understand that there must be that translation from fundamental research all the way to the end where impact is realized. And I've mentioned this aspect earlier that some of the systems might need to incorporate elements of research excellence and uh, impact so that we can actually make South Africa and the world a better place. So let me thank you and pause here, uh, Madam Program Director. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nola Mondo, for that insightful presentation. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Um, it's very interesting. And before I even ask my own questions, I will hold my questions and uh, ask uh, Professor Lynn Morris, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at the University of Witwatersrand, to take the stage now. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, um, thanks, Tandi. I'm unable to start my video. I'm wondering if the host could allow me to do that. There we go. Can you hear and see me? Yes, we loud Fabulous. and clear. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, I'll just, uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, it's visible. Fabulous. All right, but um, so once again, thanks very much. Um, as you heard, I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at WITS. I started in this position six months ago, so it's still fairly new. Um, and you'll see from the title of my topic that uh, it's, um, it is quite specific, but of course, very topical. Um, and that's because I'm a, a virologist by training and I have been um, running a lab at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, which is part of the NHLS for many years. And then I was also the interim director at the NICD before joining VIT. So this talk about the importance of research is really um, through this lens of, uh, you know, being a researcher on the ground and thinking now more broadly about um, how we can support our researchers. So, of course, as we all know, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that caused the COVID that well, is still causing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was a brand new virus um, and never been seen before. And so... Uh, 
uh, very early on, the WHO set up a panel, um, what well, was actually a blueprint, um, way back in March of last year, so literally a few months after the virus was discovered, to really set a global research agenda because we knew nothing about this virus. We didn't know where it came from. Um, and there's still some debate about that, of course. I mean, it's definitely a, an animal virus, but exactly how it came to become um, a, a, a pandemic virus is still something that is being uh, you know, researched. But also we didn't understand how it was transmitted. Of course, we had to um, develop new diagnostic tools and of course, the epidemiology, we needed to understand, um, you know, which populations this is spreading in and how it's spreading and how quickly it's spreading. And then, of course, uh, as we know, some people get sick from this virus. And so the whole clinical management, um, you know, was uh, is a whole, um, you know, very important part of, of how we, we deal with this pandemic. And then, of course, the prevention and control, particularly um, the use of PPE. And of course, that really depended on figuring out how this virus was transmitted. We knew very, very early on it was a respiratory virus, but exactly how it's, you know, it's major route of transmission, which of course now we know is aerosols. That took a while to figure out, you know, and that obviously impacts on the, um, you know, your prevention and control measures. Of course, the development of therapeutic drugs in the beginning, there were certainly lots of repurposing of old drugs. Uh, but of course, now we're seeing online, you know, coming online quite a lot of drugs that are specific for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then, of course, vaccines. And that's really been the big success story that we have, um, you know, over eight licensed vaccines. Um, and we, you know, in 18 months into a, into a pandemic has really been a, a real triumph of science. And then, of course, a very important part of this, and it's becoming increasingly important because in some ways the scientific challenges have been solved in the sense that we have a good tool to prevent this virus in the, in the form of a vaccine, but it is actually now about the ethics and the social science, how we get people to take the vaccine, and also um, what are the ethics of vaccine equity and, and, uh, and access, which um, I think you're all aware of is, uh, is a, you know, a raging uh, discussion right now. So as, uh, so as part of this um, Blueprint, the WHO then released a report in April, that, uh, so a year later, to really look at the success of this global research agenda. And there's a couple of interesting things in here. Um, so first of all, this slide, which really just shows who got engaged in the global research agenda. And as you can see, the bulk of it, um, well, a large proportion of it is universities uh, and hospitals and researchers. So a quarter of, of, the, of the collaborations were, were, from, were, were from universities. And I, I mean, it's not surprising in a way, because obviously universities are the place where, um, you know, research happens. Um, but I think it is very good to, to recognize what a major contribution it's made. Of course, the WHO made, made a major contribution. And then, of course, industry and private sector, in a way, again, that we haven't seen before, uh, certainly, you know, in terms of getting on board for all the, you know, the vaccine research. And then, of course, there's the governmental agencies, the CDC, the NIH, and here in South Africa, it would have been, you know, it, it, it's the NHLS and the, and the NICD, and then a host of other people who got involved in this incredibly, um, you know, global collaborative effort to really deal with this, uh, with this new virus. But of course, you know, the, the, the detail of, of the collaboration is, uh, is uh, you know, the, the very stark. And again, not surprising, but, you know, just good to actually, um, you know, have the, the evidence and the data to show this, that, you know, the large proportion of it is really in, uh, in North America um, and in Europe. And very little of that research is going on elsewhere in the world. There's certainly some in Asia, but certainly very little, um, you know, in Africa. And, and really what that means is, is that if there are, um, you know, specific issues we have to deal with, you know, that, um, that we really need to step up and, and, and deal with them because, and particularly when it's a global pandemic, when everybody's worried about their own countries, you know, it's really important that we actually, um, you know, put in place the, the, the right uh, measures so that our scientists and, and, our, and our, um, well, everybody involved in the, in the pandemic can, can really uh, contribute to, to this effort. So very early on, um, so the, the group at, at, a group at UCT uh, led by Ed Rabitsky, I put together this very nice um, review article that was published in Nature Reviews Immunology very it's in September last year, really just thinking about what challenges this virus presents specifically for Africa. Um, and as I say, this was very early on, and actually it's very telling that I think some of the 
you know, thoughts really did pan out. So we knew that we had limited capacity for testing and contact tracing and isolation of infected cases. We also obviously know that we have, um, we have a high burden of, of, uh, of co-infections um, that could exacerbate COVID. Um, and obviously we have a, a high rate of HIV and TB. And at the time we didn't know what, how that would impact. But we also know that we have poor healthcare systems in, in many parts of Africa. Um, and you know, are, will, will they be able to provide adequate uh, treatment for, for, for all the uh, COVID infected individuals? Um, and then of course, you know, we're so reliant on getting uh, medications and, and resources from outside of our continent that actually, you know, with the, the, sh the global shutdown, that actually the, the, the inflow of resources also impacted our ability to deal with this pandemic. And then a big, a big aspect is our lack of manufacturing capacity on the African continent and, and particularly also in, in South Africa. And of course, there have been some very recent announcements that are, that are changing that. And then, of course, you know, weak economies and, you know, the ability to sustain, to, to sustain uh, you know, extended lockdowns. Um, I think, you know, in, it's, uh, in, in some countries less able to do it uh, than others, particularly those in the north. So there's also a very interesting um, uh, article written by some Nigerian colleagues published in the University World News, just really focusing on the role of, um, of universities in, de in dealing with COVID. Um, and I've just pulled out some of the, 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 the things from their article. Of course, we know knowledge generation starts at universities and that universities, because they have the expertise, but they also have it in lots of different areas. And so they can, they can, they can take a multidisciplinary approach to a problem. Um, and then of course, as we saw, including in South Africa, that many academic experts played leading roles in government committees and programs. You certainly know that the MAC in, in, um, in, in this country had many involved many university academics. And then collaborations between universities and national public health institutes have really facilitated a lot of the COVID response in many African countries and true here in South Africa. And I'm going to elaborate a bit on that. And then the other, the, the other thing is that, you know, many uh, Africa's had a long history of, um, of having, well, long-term donors, particularly like Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust. And they have made these long-term commitments in African research and, and capacity building. And that was, that was very well used during, uh, you know, to also deal with the COVID um, pandemic. And, um, and then of course, you know, that universities generally um, are the, the, the source of factual information and, and people trust, uh, you know, the information that comes out of universities. And I think that's becoming even more important as we um, go into this phase of, um, of a lot of misinformation, particularly around vaccines. But the other thing I, I, um, I, I actually did a quick um, uh, analysis of all of the publications on COVID. And obviously it's only been last year and this year, um, in the web of science. So I literally just typed in South Africa and I also typed in university. And as you can see, um, so about um, a thousand publications a year, but, but, but around 90% of them, the authors have university affiliations. And so I think that really speaks to, you know, the critical role that universities have played in the, in the research agenda in dealing with, with COVID. But certainly COVID has completely changed the way that we do science. Um, and we, we know that so we've seen that, you know, research is informing policy real time. So findings that, you know, that, that are new findings are, are literally being implemented as they, as they are discovered. So it's really quite a remarkable time for science. There's also been in, incredible public engagement. The, the public have got to understand epidemiology and R naught and flattening the curve. And, you know, it's, it's been quite remarkable how um, you know, the public have got involved in, in this because it's affected all of us. Um, another very uh, unusual thing is people are putting unpublished data straight onto Twitter. So the way that data is, scientific data is being shared. And there's also been lots of open science and open data initiatives, which have been very important. And, and actually that's probably going to change uh, for, for good. I think that, that many of those things will remain. There's also been... Um, you know, cataloging and tracking of all the projects and all the funding that's been going around. So we can actually see where the money's being spent and how much money's being spent. And in fact, there's been huge investment in vaccine science. In the US, the Operation Warp, Warp Speed, um, which really funded the development of many of the vaccines that we have now was $18 billion. Um, so, this, uh, so another thing that's really, uh, you know, 
changed a lot through COVID is, is how is the very, very close collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry and really getting them on board to solve this, this problem. Um, but of course, there's also been an explosion of scientific information. I mean, it's just been overwhelming and it's been very hard actually to keep up. Um, so, you know, a quick search on PubMed, over 180,000 COVID-19 publications. In fact, of all the publications, pub, of all publications uh, last year, 4% of them were actually on COVID. Um, and that's publications in every single topic that, uh, you know, so that's really dominated our thoughts. And, um, and there's also been the, the, the rise of these preprint servers, BioArchive and MedArchive, where people basically just put their publications straight onto these sites. So it's before peer review. And of course, the, the advantage of that is that people get access to information very quickly. The disadvantage, of course, is that uh, if, it's, if the information is wrong, it is out there. Um, but of course, when, you know, one needs to, to you know, treat this information carefully, um, but, but, but the other good thing about getting it out there is that people can then, you have basically the whole scientific community doing a peer review process. So it gets um, shot down very quickly if, it's, if it is incorrect. Um, but actually the traditional journals have also accelerated their peer review process and their publication process in a way that also, I hope, I hope that will continue. Um, another thing that happened is, is that 80% of the journals made all their articles on COVID free, open access. And again, you know, let's hope that that trend continues. And then, of course, there was a proliferation of, uh, you know, different, you know, apps and AI powered things to actually help you review this vast volume of literature, you know, using keywords to just literally try and stay on top of, of what was what really was overwhelming. But I briefly just want to talk about the genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2, um, because that's really also been something that I think has gripped um, many people, you know, tracking these different variants um, uh, around the world. Um, and so this is really, um, you know, sequencing of the virus. And you can also measure how much the virus is evolving. And you can use that to assess the, how effective some of your existing vaccines and your existing drugs are going to be. Um, and then allied with that is the use of this database. Uh, which actually existed before COVID. It was actually a, a database for flu, um, but it really is a, to allow people to share uh, all of these sequences. Um, and it now has over 3 million sequences of SARS-CoV-2, more than all the other viruses together. It's, just, it's quite phenomenal. And so this has really facilitated, again, a rapid exchange and analysis of sequence data for, for global public health benefit. So that's been a, a real um, advantage. So I just briefly want to talk on you know, the, the, the incredible effort that this group has done for, for our country, the, the, the Network for Genomic Surveillance in South Africa, and it's really been headed by Tulio de Oliveira uh, at UKZN and now also uh, University of Stellenbosch. But actually it involves all of the public health labs around the country. Um, and many of these are also, they, they actually head the virology departments in the various universities. And so it really speaks to the, 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 the importance of public health institutes linking up with the you know, with universities and with the researchers and, and to really have a national footprint. And this group has just done, you know, tremendous work. Um, so this is just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of what they've done. So they've been sequencing SARS-CoV-2 uh, from cases in South Africa right since the beginning, as you can see, right going right back uh, to, uh, to Epi Week, I think that's Epi Week uh, 12. So, uh, so right back from March the 4th, when we had our first case last year, um, and you can see that the number of, of sequences that they have um, generated, um, you know, has increased over time. Um, and that's, of course, as more labs come on board, but also at, with each wave. So, of course, with each wave, more, more viruses are getting sequenced. And, of course, the thing about these sequences is that they can tell you, um, you know, what, the, what these variants are. And as I think you, everybody's now familiar with variants of concern, and there are four of them. Um, and the one that's really dominating the world now is Delta. Um, and that was first detected uh, about a year ago, first in India. And the, 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 what, the concerning thing about Delta is it's a much more transmissible variant. And, and of course, the evidence shows that it's now dominating the epidemic all over the world, including South Africa. But I also just want to briefly mention the Beta variant, which was first detected here in South Africa by, that, uh, by the, the NGS group. Um, and again, this, the, 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 it, it does have a, a slightly more transmissible phenotype, but actually what's more concerning about this particular variant 
is that it, um, it's escaped uh, antibody um, immunity. And so the prediction was that some vaccines may be less effective against it. And so what this group has been doing is been tracking all of these variants. And this is just a very nice graphic that uh, the, uh, Janelle and Catherine at the NICD shared with me. And you can see how quickly this changes. So the blue pie is the beta variant, which uh, you will recall is um, you know, what dominated our, um, you know, our second wave. Um, and, uh, but you can see by June, so literally a month later, and these are large numbers of sequences um, that, that, uh, that, that, well, the Delta was present in May at 16%, but by June, it became 66%. So just to give you a sense of how quickly this virus, you know, can basically transmit through populations. And as you can see, July, August, September, we're now in the 90%, and just really that our epidemic is dominated uh, by the Delta variant. Um, but you can see that beta is still there at a very at a very low level. And of course, there is this other variant that was reported in South Africa, the C1.2. And just to say it is now detected in all provinces, but it has not expanded. So it's just at a low level. So, um, you know, there are all sorts of, uh, of things that determine whether, you know, um, variants will take off or not. But this particular one is not able to compete with the Delta variant. And so it's being maintained at very low levels. But I do briefly just want to mention this uh, beta variant because this also really speaks to, you know, the importance of, of, of really um, the, the, the kinds of work that's, that, that's done in laboratories that might seem a little bit obscure, perhaps, and, but, but actually how, what a critical role it's played in, in COVID. So this is the measurement of neutralizing antibodies. And these assays were all developed actually for HIV. Then, of course, as soon as... Um, COVID hit the scene, uh, Penny Moore, who, uh, who, who heads the lab at the NICD, quickly, um, you know, made the assay work for COVID and very quickly showed that, in fact, the beta variant, as I mentioned, was first described in South Africa, uh, complete, uh, shows substantial or complete escape um, from, um, you know, from, uh, from neutralizing antibodies. Um, and, and it also escaped from therapeutically relevant monoclonal antibodies. I mean, fortunately, we're not using those too widely here, but but, uh, but there was some concern that uh, in countries that, you know, that are using those antibodies that, uh, that indeed um, you know, this would, would compromise their efficacy. Um, and so the, the graph shows the convalescent plasma. So this just shows the, the drop in uh, neutralization uh, against the beta variant. And 48% of them, there was a complete knockout. Um, and then of course, the concern was about what does this mean for vaccines? And indeed, um, Penny and Kurt and the team showed um, and this was working very closely with Prof. Shabir Mahdi, that, um, that, that uh, the, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which I think you're all aware we didn't end up using because literally because, the, because of the beta variant um, not, um, uh, you know, not working very well against the beta variant. And this was then shown in the lab that indeed, um, you know, that these sera were, were, were less able to, to neutralize that virus. So it really speaks to the importance of this kind of, 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 of research and, um, and also really the importance actually of people quickly being able to, um, you know, to, to, to use their expertise and to apply to immediate problems. So this is my last slide. Um, so, so research has, um, I mean, it's just been remarkable to watch. You know, I've been trying to make a vaccine to HIV for 25 years. And so to watch them making COVID vaccines in under a year has just been, you know, really easy. Yeah, well, really, really, well, it's not been easy to watch. It's been um, fascinating to watch, but it, it is, but, you know, HIV is a much tougher target. You know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a relatively easy target. And my hope is that the scientists that have, you know, switched to working on COVID will now switch back to HIV because HIV is really the, the, the tough nut to crack and that they will take that drive energy enthusiasm with them and solve the HIV problem. But I think the other thing that, that this has, this, the other lessons that we've learned from this is that existing platforms and net, networks that could be rapidly you know, turned around, um, but it also required significant funding. Um, and just to say as well, that certainly many agencies in South Africa, in, including the NRF and including the MRC, you know, had some very specific focused uh, programs to support research yeah. to really stimulate the research agenda in South Africa. And as I mentioned, you know, universities have played a critical role in the COVID response. 
And again, highlighting the importance of, of long-term investment in basic and clinical research. But I think we've also learned about the need to invest in local manufacturing. I think we've been caught short, not only in South Africa, but on the whole continent, in our reliance on, on, on outside um, you know, uh, countries outside of our continent to provide the, provide the reagents and the vaccines that we need. And certainly that's going to, um, well, it has already caused a shift in the way we think about um, you know, our, our own needs. And there's certainly a number of exciting initiatives about you know, um, developing vaccines locally. And I think what's really important to highlight is that uh, these research challenges are going to continue to emerge, including um, new variants of concern. This virus is going to keep mutating. And of course it mutates primarily in people who are unvaccinated. And so really the, you know, the push now is to, um, is to get as many people vaccinated as possible so that we can stop this virus replicating and we can stop the emergence of new variants. But certainly there's still a lot of research that, uh, you know, that we need to do. And um, SARS-CoV-2 is not going to be the last virus that's going to cause a pandemic. So it also speaks to a long-term commitment, you know, to investing in, um, you know, in many of these um, research endeavors. And with that, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. That's very insightful of the work that has been done uh, in partnership. I think uh, the, the most important thing for me are the collaborations that have happened around the world. Um, without wasting a time, I'm going to ask Dr. McLean Sibanda, who's the managing director of Bigen Global Limited. And uh, over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mkwebi, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I've got a few slides, and I will uh, get through them, uh, you know, quite uh, quickly. So I think we've we've had uh, you know different uh, you know perspectives uh, in respect of uh, the importance of research and research uh, impact. And I'm approaching the topic this afternoon largely from an innovation uh, you know, perspective. And I think reflecting on what uh, Professor Lynn Morris has also covered uh, is the fact that you know, quite often um, you know, some of the research, we wonder what the impact is. Uh, but then I think when we really focus um, on, on, on solving specific problems, uh, we realize that there's some tools uh, that already we have uh, developed. So, I mean, notwithstanding, I think my approach is largely more from uh, perhaps more applied research, uh, but uh, there's uh, important room for uh, fundamental basic research to be able to provide the tools uh, and the foundation for us to be able to solve uh, the many problems. And I reflect on the scramble for vaccines uh, that uh, also has been uh, you know, mentioned. Uh, and Africa finds itself uh, on, on the begging side in terms of vaccines. And it's no wonder why that is the case because we have not invested enough uh, in terms of uh, research uh, um, in, in the areas uh, of uh, disease or generally in research. Uh, we are aspiring to get to 1% of GDP uh, in the different African countries, uh, in my mind, I, I, I think in my recollection, there's no country that has made 1% of GDP yet. South Africa, the last time I checked, we're sitting at about 0.84% uh, uh, of GDP. Um, and so it's important, I think the, the first point is that it's important to, res to invest in research. Um, and what type of research? Research that is important in terms of uh, us solving uh, the myriad of challenges that we face uh, as uh, people. So for South Africa, uh, it's important that uh, there is a prioritization uh, to solve uh, challenges that we face, but also uh, to contribute uh, to global uh, challenges. Uh, but how, what, and I think one of the other things is as we invest in research, uh, it's also important uh, to invest uh, in research enabling um, capacity. Uh, and that is the innovation capacity, the technology transfer capacity, uh, so that we're able in essence to translate uh, the research into things that can be used uh, in society. 
In this regard, I want to uh, refer to uh, Clayton Christensen's book, The, Par the Prosperity Paradox. Uh, although he defines innovation in essence as a, as a change in the process uh, it, by which an organization transforms labor, capital, material, and information into products uh, and services of a greater value, uh, I would also like to perhaps take a much more inclusive uh, definition uh, which is in essence uh, looking at uh, you know how there are improvements. Uh, so it could not, it cannot be necessarily uh, you know, new products and services. It could be just enhancing those particular products, uh, in, improving efficiencies, and that in essence brings us to the definitions uh, around sustaining innovations, efficiency innovations, uh, and also market creating innovations. And I think if one listens, in essence, uh, reads a book uh, and also really goes deeper into some of the thinking around uh, the prosperity paradox is that for us to be able to um, uh, develop and become perhaps more industrialized and, uh, and, and, and have full benefit uh, of the opportunities that are being presented by, amongst other things, the African continental free trade area, uh, it's important uh, that we focus on market creating innovations uh, because the impact uh, is actually quite uh, you know, you know, significant. It cuts right across uh, and it catalyzes uh, you know, different industries. So as we undertake research, uh, it's also important to actually figure out what is the anticipated impact uh, of that particular research. But the, the, the whole path of uh, converting research results uh, into innovation, uh, which are in essence uh, the new products, services uh, that are actually being used or being consumed by the market uh, or improvements uh, on existing services and, and products uh, that the market is willing and able to pay for. Uh, it, that conversion uh, it requires certain uh, particular skills, uh, but that conversion uh, is without its own challenges. And that's where we come uh, to, uh, to face a value of death uh, in terms of uh, really assessing to what extent does uh, it affect the research impact uh, because some of the research gets done, but it never sees the light of day. Why? Because it falls into this, uh, uh, into this uh, value of death because there's not sufficient funding uh, available uh, to enable the research uh, to become uh, innovation. At times, uh, there is not uh, appropriate uh, human resources and skills uh, to convert uh, this uh, research into useful products. Uh, at times, the environment is not appropriate. Uh, oftentimes, the infrastructure to do the conversion uh, is not uh, in place. Uh, and in many African countries, uh, the, there is uh, uh, a dearth, in essence, of uh, industry. Uh, to be off takers uh, of uh, that particular research, which in essence also provides opportunities uh, for universities uh, to become enterprising, uh, to also start to focus uh, in essence uh, on spinning out uh, companies out of uh, the research that, that is done. Now, I think what we've seen uh, over the past, um, I would say since about 2002, when the R&D strategy uh, got uh, published was an increased effort around uh, patenting. And that led to the IPI Act in 2008 that came into effect in 2010. Uh, and uh, so I think it's also quite important to strike a balance uh, that not everything uh, needs to be patented. Um, there, there is research uh, that can have impact without necessarily uh, going through a patent, uh, it can be commercialized without necessarily having a patent. Uh, one needs to take a holistic view uh, in respect of intellectual property uh, and look at the different uh, forms of intellectual property and choose the most appropriate ones uh, to be able to achieve impact uh, with the research uh, results. But notwithstanding, uh, I think there is uh, what we've seen is also an increase 
uh, of uh, this culture of uh, commercialization amongst universities in South Africa. Uh, but it's, we still got a long way uh, to go. Well, licensing is the most preferred, understandably, because that's what the Act also encourages. But also licensing provides uh, more options uh, in terms of how one can be able to achieve impact uh, with, res with uh, research uh, that has been undertaken. And then startups uh, is another one. And over the, uh, the period uh, of 2006 and 2015, Indeed, uh, we, what one saw was an increase in terms of uh, licenses that uh, the universities were granting. Uh, and uh, one hopes that indeed there's a mechanism to monitor uh, those licenses to make sure that the licenses have, uh, are being fully commercialized uh, and there is impact uh, out there where there's creation of new companies that then create new jobs uh, or companies that create new products that have an impact uh, on society uh, and uh, and so forth. Um, but I, I spoke about the infrastructure uh, and also spoke about uh, the human resources. And I think we need to appreciate that researchers play an important role. And I think it's important that we don't uh, convert researchers, all the researchers to be um, you know, founders of startups. Uh, I think that it's important to actually strike that balance where researchers uh, still continue to research, still continue to generate new knowledge. And therefore, uh, we need to look at how do we create an enabling environment uh, um, amongst the universities, within the universities, so that we can attract entrepreneurs, so that we can attract uh, investors uh, as well because commercialization involves entrepreneurship uh, and uh, entrepreneurship the, it's really a process of creating value uh, by bringing together different resources uh, to exploit an opportunity. Uh, and quite often the opportunity is seen by people that are not too close uh, to the research, uh, but have an interest uh, in the uh, research. Uh, and they've got different skill sets uh, to the researchers. Uh, so there's a need to create uh, an environment that enables faculty, students, entrepreneurs uh, to identify uh, research uh, that has got potential to create opportunities, has got potential to have impact, uh, and in essence, provide incentives uh, and, uh, and, 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 and a mechanism for them to be able to take the risk uh, to bring that research to market so that it has uh, impact. In this regard, uh, it's important uh, to establish pipelines. Uh, I'm aware some uh, universities are setting up their own incubators, uh, looking at setting up their own science parks. And the bigger question really is, uh, have we explored uh, the partnerships uh, that could exist uh, between existing uh, incubators, existing science parks, uh, so that uh, they, the, the, we attract the entrepreneurs uh, to be interested uh, in the research uh, that uh, we do. So I think in, in conclusion, I just want to, uh, you know, perhaps uh, again remind ourselves that when uh, we're talking about the innovation aspects, the commercialization aspects, uh, patenting is a good thing, but it's not the end game. Um, and if it's done, uh, we need to remember that it's a means uh, to an end. Uh, and we need to be very clear in terms of what that end is, uh, what impact we want to actually achieve. Uh, and in essence, uh, we, there is a need to just uh, shift uh, the focus uh, in terms of research uh, to make sure that it's addressing societal needs uh, and uh, therefore the need for a much more engaged university that is in touch uh, with uh, its uh, stakeholders uh, at large uh, so that uh, it does and undertakes research that is relevant. Um, it is a process uh, to get impact. Uh, and I think we, we heard just now uh, from uh, Professor you know, Morris around uh, the research, HIV research that she's been undertaking. Uh, uh, and many people can say, well, we wasted money, but I think there's very important uh, learnings that have been learned uh, in terms of uh, the research that has been undertaken in HIV 
we got a better understanding uh, of uh, of the disease, uh, and also that is informed um, other researchers to come up with better ways uh, of managing uh, the disease. The hubs uh, and entrepreneurs are critical for impact. Uh, the impact cannot only be achieved by the universities on their own. Uh, universities uh, need to work within a, an ecosystem uh, to be able to achieve uh, results. And I think the last uh, perhaps uh, two points uh, is uh, to be aware uh, to be uh, to be aware of uh, the fallacy of build it and they will come. Uh, and therefore, when we undertake research, uh, always uh, the the emphasis on what impact are we looking for? Uh, and uh, is there a problem uh, that exists that we are looking to solve? Or are we anticipating a future uh, problem? Uh, but I think more importantly, the last point really is uh, uh, for universities uh, to approach uh, the, uh, the innovation uh, component or the commercialization component uh, of, uh, of uh, impact. Uh, for innovation as being, um, for, for, for what it is, it's about getting the research out to society, for society to consume and for society to benefit. Uh, and so let, there should be less emphasis on the third stream income. Yes, uh, some research results are in blockbusters. Uh, that's great, but in essence, uh, that's one uh, in, um, in many, um, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of research uh, that to be consumed in that particular regard. So thank you very much uh, uh, to, uh, to everyone for listening and I hand over back uh, to uh, Dr. Mkwebi. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sibanda, for that uh, eloquent presentation. We do have a number of questions that are coming from the chat and uh, I'm going to start shoot straight to the questions, starting with two questions that I'm going to read. Uh, the first one is, we've learned from the CARS research that COVID has impacted male, female researchers differently. How has the NRF adjusted its research support for male and female researchers or in general, post-COVID? That's one. I think that's specific directed to you, uh, Dr. Nelo Mondo. The second one is universities have corporate and social responsibilities. How can we ensure that corporate influence does not violate social responsibility? So I'm going to take those two. Perhaps with the last question, I would like to add a point about quantifying our impact from the social sciences and humanities. Lynn, you spoke very much about the, the natural science, health research, and the COVID genetics related. But I'm also interested in the influence of humanities and social sciences in alleviating the impacts of the pandemic, because it's very much a social disruptor, as you will agree with me. And I wonder if we are keeping an eye on, <clears throat> on, on the work of humanities and social sciences. So I'll give it to you, uh, Dr. Nalomondo first, and then I'll come to, to you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Program Director. The, the question is about how the NRF has adjusted uh, the support for males or females or in general post uh, COVID. I think at this particular stage, we have not really done much adjustment um, other than uh, looking at the bigger context of transformation where we are looking at the excellent definition of transformation, which is not, not just on the demographics alone, but looking into, for instance, geographic distribution and so on of the resources that we have, that we are we have, we have, we have to distribute or invest in particular areas. So the adjustment for now has not been look, looking specifically to say, we know that COVID has affected males this way or females this way, and therefore let's, let's invest differently. So we're not looking to that, but with time, probably we're gonna reflect and say, what have we learned from COVID and how do we actually adjust to that? Thank you. Professor Morris. Yeah, actually, I mean, I'd like to, to comment on that point because I um, there has actually been a study looking at um, 
that papers published by men and women uh, before COVID and after COVID. And actually there was a drop in publications by women. And the authors um, attribute that to um, the fact that, that um, you know, during lockdowns when kids weren't at school and, you know, that actually the responsibility uh, affected women more or the COVID affected women more. Um, and that, you know, is reflected then in, in lower, you know, research, research output. So, so there is actually some, some data to, you know, to support that, um, that, that women did uh, take, take more of the brunt, certainly in terms of uh, the, 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 their science careers. But in terms of the question about um, uh, corporate and social responsibility, I mean, that's not obviously unique to, you know, to COVID times. I mean, that's a general, um, you know, consideration um, that, you know, that, that universities, you um, obviously have, uh, you know, um, social responsibilities and, um, and they need to manage corporate involvement very carefully. And that's done through, you know, through a number of mechanisms, because certainly one wouldn't want undue influence, um, you know, on, 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 on the outputs of universities. And so all of those things are carefully managed. I don't think that there's anything that would have been, um, you know, that would, would, would have exacerbated that during COVID necessarily, unless maybe I'm not understanding the, the question very well. And then the, the comment on the quantifying the, the, the impact of humanities research and social sciences. Do you have a comment on that? Well, just to say, you know, that, um, that, that research into COVID, obviously, and I've just focused on, you know, as you the, saw on the, the sort of yes. virology and the, you know, the, the vaccine development side, but, you know, there's research in all sorts of areas. And I mean, the research also on, in the economic side, has also been very revealing and actually again showing how women have been disproportionately affected right. economically. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so and 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 I also alluded to the fact that in some ways the scientific challenges of COVID have been solved. Um, mm. And actually the real challenge now is going to be in the humanities. I mean, I think one of yeah. the biggest challenges is how to um, to get around vaccine hesitancy. I mean, we need to understand right. that much better um, because you know, the, the, the evidence and the science is there, um, and we're obviously not communicating it well enough, but we need to understand, you know, why people are so hesitant to take something that, that, that can solve this problem. You know, we've all lived through, you know, 18 months of just of real, of, of very difficult times, and we have a solution, and somehow um, pe some people are reluctant to, you know, to adopt that solution. And so I think that's really where the behavioral scientists, the psychologists, you know, really need to, you know, to, to understand that it's, it's probably a much harder thing to, you know, to solve because, uh, you know, changing people's behavior is notoriously difficult. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, perhaps to latch on that, I'm going to bring you here, if you pardon me, Professor Maiki, so as a representative of, I guess, of universities from the research side, um, with regards to the issue of males and females, particularly with regards to women, there's a policy brief that was um, sent out through um, the research that was done led by Professor Jonathan Janssen not long ago, looking at the impact of COVID on women academics. And that policy brief had, had some recommendations for institutions. And I just want to find out um, uh, whether uh, this has been taken up for implementation at institutional level. And that will require partnerships, of course, with uh, bodies like the NRF, like CHE and USAF. And if you do, you have a comment on that, Professor Mayekiso? Thank you, Andy, for the for the for the question. Uh, I haven't seen that study, so I'm yeah. not able to to comment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, it's something that we can discuss later. We do have a, a lot of questions coming from uh, from the audience. The next question that I want to to ask is about the effect of quickly collecting unproven, unpublished data getting posted on social media, a great social impact one supposes. As much as said, 80% of journals cover our data free also, but how do universities ensure that this does not affect research impact of researchers in academia? Um, the other one, which is related to the NRF impact framework is, to what extent will the NRF impact framework consider 
existing measures of impact of academic research, such as impact factors, alternative metrics and activities in science communication through platforms such as the NPOs like the Conversation Africa. Those are the two questions. Um, I think the last one is directly to the NRF. The other ones, I mean, you can, uh, Dr. Sibanda and uh, uh, Professor Morris, you can take that one on. So I'm happy to, you know, to tackle the, um, the, the, um, the, the data, the, the um, uh, unpublished data getting posted on social media. Um, I, right. You know, it's, um, I, you know, so it's been great, you know, that information's been getting out there quickly, but the downside of that is, is, is if it's wrong information. And right. we've seen how social media has been used. And, um, and so, it, and, and, and I can see how, you know, the public is confused. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it, it has been a confusing time for everybody. And so I guess, you know, I always just, you know, really emphasize to people about using trusted sources of information. So, you know, the WHO website or the Department of Health website or, or trusted sources of info, always treat information on social media with some suspicion. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think, you know, for me, one of the, you know, one of the, I guess, terrible things has been, you know, the, the adoption of ivermectin, for instance, when there really is no scientific evidence that this drug works. And yet somehow, right through social media, you know, people have been, uh, you know, saying that this, you know, is a wonder drug and people are taking it and there's really no scientific basis for that. So it can be really, you know, damaging. So, so it's really about people relying more on the more traditional and trusted sources of information rather than social media. Thanks. Yeah, so I think, I mean, the, you know, the challenge with unpublished, um, you know, data or data that has not been peer reviewed is that, uh, you know, quite often it could be false as well. Uh, so I think it's important to, um, to, to get research results published uh, through proper channels. I mean, I think for me, one of the most shocking ones was a study on the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, uh, which had, uh, I think there were, 12, there, were, there were less than 20 participants in the study. And uh, the study seemed to suggest that uh, it's, the efficiencies were very, very low. Uh, and uh, you know, with us, with such a number uh, of uh, of uh, people enrolled in the study, it's not a, a proper you know study to make uh, conclusive um, uh, conclusions in terms of uh, efficacy. But again, I think it's you know it's a balancing thing because uh, the people that uh, consume uh, you know the data that comes through social media, you know, quite often do not know how thorough that is. Uh, and uh, if it's sensational, people are bound to believe it. Uh, and I think when one is dealing with a pandemic or something as sensitive as this, you really want uh, to be able to have proper research uh, data you know, published. Thanks. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nelomondo? If I just maybe come to the same point in terms of the, right. the data. Um, there's also a different angle where, you know, um, social media actually gives a lot of information about the uh, public understanding of certain things. Like one can sort of use that to then gauge uh, what are the public sentiments in a particular space. So it also depends on what, uh, you know, what, uh, what is being presented because there are, there are areas like data science that actually can help in filtering some of the information. But more than that, to help us in understanding things like, you know, vaccine hesitancy, you can sort uh -huh. of get too much information on the, on the, social media about why are people not going for these vaccines and so on. Of course, one has to, to look at it in the, in the bigger context. So if maybe you allow me to then jump to the question that you directed right. to me as well. Um, the, the, the question about the other elements of impact. In my presentation, I covered that we're gonna look at societal impact without necessarily compromising on the knowledge impact as well, which is more about you know uh, uh, the impact factors, the likes of the uh, you know, which are based on the citations and all other uh, components. So one can see this as something that is not, we're not saying we're replacing these forms of impacts in a particular way. We are saying we are bringing a new element, a new dimension right. that's going to look at what will be the total impact at the end without compromising on what we have. And right. of course, we also then look into even issues of publications in, in areas like, you know, the Conversations Africa and so on. As you know, within the revised mandate of the NRF, 
we, we are now also responsible for the science engagement element. And the science engagement element talks about that kind of public engagement, public understanding of science and so on. And we're gonna bring all of those elements into these new measures. So in the main, I think it becomes a bigger and comprehensive uh, a pool of things that we're measuring as opposed to the narrow. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you, thank you. I just want to, to turn the, the conversation a little bit, perhaps uh, focus on you, Dr. Sibanda. With, you made a comment about uh, innovation hubs and uh, the fact that universities um, want to have their own innovation hubs and you we could be looking at alternative measures where we strengthen the partnerships I guess with the central the, uh, innovation hubs. I'm just uh, what are your thoughts about perhaps government uh, investment on innovation hubs at uh, regional level because I think one of the compounding factors is that not all provinces or even regions are the same and they've got the same access to such central facilities what 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 do you think should be the approach yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, it's a very important question, and I think it's a question that was considered as well when uh, the IPI Act started to be implemented as to uh, whether every university needs to have a fully-fledged tech transfer office uh, or uh, regional tech transfer offices. And at the time, uh, there were two regional tech transfer offices that we established, one in KZN and the other one for uh, the Eastern Cape. Um, and, and, and so if one looks, for example, at a, at a hub, uh, take, for example, the Innovation Hub, right. that's a regional hub. It's for, really for the province of Gauteng. Mm. Uh, and uh, it would be important for University of Pretoria, TUT, VETS, and so forth, uh, to see how they collaborate. And similarly, in the Eastern Cape, uh, what kind of a, a hub is required uh, and how can the universities start to collaborate uh, to move things uh, forward? Uh, but also I think what that does is in essence, uh, helps to, um, to foster collaboration because in that process of trying to commercialize certain things uh, um, and having a central hub that can be uh, utilized by different universities, uh, researchers are bound to, to bump into each other. Uh, and also you're providing a central place for the entrepreneurs. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, thank you. Do, do, Lynn, I, I heard you, I saw you. Uh, no. as if you I agree with everything you said. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> then there's a follow-up question from the corporate uh, responsibility question that says the gain of function research and COVID-19 has been linked to universities. What is your opinion on this? Yeah, thanks. I saw that that question. Obviously, a, a scientist on the in the audience. Um, so, gain of function um, research is basically trying to um, to modify, in this case, obviously a virus, um, to change its properties. Um, and as we can see, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is doing that naturally. You know, as it's circulating around the world, it's getting better and better. Right? It's becoming more transmissible. It's being it's getting more resistant you know, it, it, it's doing that naturally. And that's what viruses do. They basically yeah. replicate and they accidentally make mutations and some of them give them an advantage and that's how mm. they end up spreading. Mm. So, so, what, um, so, so what some researchers are, are trying to do, and this is not just in SARS, it's in other viruses, is almost to try and predict that. And so that you know where the virus is going. And so you can be on the lookout for that. So that, okay. those kinds of experiments are obviously done under very tightly controlled laboratory conditions in what's called BSL-3 or sometimes BSL-4 laboratories. Because mm. obviously if you do create a virus that's, you know, that has better function, you know, that uh, it needs to be under very stringent conditions. Right. So, um, so certainly that kind of research does happen and it's, it's really there to, to help us, you know, to inform us um, uh, of uh, what to expect. Mm, 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 mm. Right. And then I just want to, to, well, maybe from each and every one of you or whoever can take this, this comment about the role that of the 
well, the impact of the pandemic on cultural and traditional practices at a local level. Why I'm asking this question is that at regional level, particularly at our region in the Eastern Cape, we've got these um, incubators. One of our incubators at Nelson Mandela University, for example, called Propeller Incubator, which is a university partnership with the with the with civil society and the private sector, and is trying to promote innovation within communities. And one of the ways to do that is to encourage communities to partner with the university so that they gain something out of uh, the knowledge that comes from the university, but also the co-creation of knowledge. What I want to find out from you is how do we promote what I would call grassroots innovation for, now I'm thinking ahead, for other risks that may come in the future, utilizing the knowledge that resides at university, but effectively such that it's not only for the so-called elites at, at university, but mm -hmm. affecting the communities directly. Well, I'm willing to have a bash at this, but I think um, McLean is best, best place to answer this. Um, and I think it's a critical question because actually if we're trying to solve society's problems, we need mm. to engage with society and hear what their problems are. And That's actually right. we need to engage more with communities um, because actually we, we, otherwise we are just in universities, we are just working in these ivory towers and we, you know, if That's we want right. to be innovative and we're trying to solve problems, we have to have stronger links with communities. So I completely uh, endorse your, your, your view. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, Lean has really, you know, covered it. I mean, universities um, are there to serve society. And uh, I, th I think it's important that the university's primary uh, responsibility is to the community that it finds itself in. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think some of the ways uh, is to encourage students uh, to find research projects uh, that have got an impact uh, on the communities, perhaps to challenge uh, students, uh, and this could be annual innovation competitions or whatever it is, yeah. mm. uh, for them to actually work, engage with the communities, spend some time in the communities, and come up with uh, projects uh, that uh, can be implemented uh, or basically have been implemented over a short period of time that demonstrate impact uh, on society. Because that way we also, I think we will, will get to a point where uh, the, 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 the man in the street in essence has got more confidence mm. uh, at, in, the, in the universities and doesn't see um, the universities as being something that is out of reach you yeah. know, for them, mm. uh, but uh, sees a university as something that actually serves them. And I think the, the pandemic has also provided uh, opportunities. I mean, I've seen, uh, I think, one or two universities opening up uh, their campuses to be used as vaccination sites. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's a good thing. Uh, and for the universities that have got medical schools, I'm aware of others, like we've, we've got dental schools where they open up um, for the communities. That's a good thing. And obviously the law clinics, uh, also uh, serve uh, you know, the community. So we need to find a way uh, that uh, we can make sure that research uh, uh, directly benefits society. Right, right, thank you. Maybe this one last point uh, for you, Dr. Nelo Mondo. What, what do you, how do you see the role of the NRF uh, in this, um, I guess, the more grassroots level interventions uh, from, from research at universities? I think that's a very good question. Uh, the, the thing here is that, and I think my colleagues have covered it, we need to have a, an open system in one way or another. Open system in a way that the university can talk to, to the community. On the other side, community is sort of you know, allowed to come and interact with the universities. Mm -hmm. If I use one example of uh, the project that was done now under COVID was the National Ventilators Project, where it was very quick for South Africa to then produce 20,000 ventilators, but it was because the world was running short of ventilators. Right. Mm. What was missing at the time was that we did not even know that we have capability of making ventilators, but we had pieces mm. of research, pieces of science right. that we were seeing in various places. You know, mm. Mm. If we had this engagement in the past, probably, and McLean will agree with me on this part, that probably we could have been a hub for ventilators probably for the last 10 years because it's not like we use any new technology. We mm -hmm. use the same technology that was there, but lack of interaction with the communities that would then say, this is what we need. 
probably it could have propelled scientists to then actually say, we can package mm. it for your, for your problem. Right. That's something that I think we really need to, uh, to, to bring on board. And the NRF, of course, uh, with the science engagement being part of our, our um, uh, uh, mandate now, we need to then facilitate that and factor that within the funding instruments. Then say, if you're just doing research within the university, uh, without the community, we prioritize it less, but show or demonstrate that you're actually engaging with, uh, with the universities. Whether you're doing it by, uh, you know, you going to the university, I mean, you as a researcher at the university going to the public or the public coming to you, it shouldn't really matter. We need to sort right. of ways of uh, embracing that. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one last roundup, um, just half a minute for, for each, each one of you. Um, a question, a last closing comment about um, the future. What do you see uh, in the future? What, do we, what needs to change so that we can have real impact? In fact, let me rephrase my question. From everything that you've said, it seems to me that we need to instill systems thinking in intervening and in helping solve the challenges that the pandemic um, has, has put on us. How do you think this can be operationalized? I'll start with you, Lynn, uh, just half a minute. Well, um, I, was, um, I was going to comment on, um, you know, that, that we've all been through a very tough time, but actually um, some good things have come out of COVID. And I think what we no. need to do is take those, those things and, as you say, you know, almost make them part of our, our, our way of doing, you know, that, that actually mm -hmm. let's take what was good and, 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 and run with it. And that in actual fact, you know, after the 1918 flu epidemic, there was a boom, you know, and actually, you know, we, we as humans, we do bounce back and that, you know, maybe after all this is over, actually, we will be in a better place. And so I guess it is about just maintaining hope and optimism and um, that we will survive this and, and come through right. it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sibanda? Yeah, so I think, you know, the takeaway for me, for me is the fact that uh, uh, research is important uh, and we need... And, and what has come out of uh, the pandemic is in essence uh, exactly that. Uh, I think that in the absence of research we would not be where we are. I think there will be chaos. I think uh, this was one uh, you know, virus that we was very little understood. Uh, and uh, research has helped us to be able to get to a point where we can manage it. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore moving forward, we need to uh, invest more in research we need to find ways of encouraging private sector uh, to invest in research uh, so that research is not only seen as being funded you know, by the government, mm -hmm. but I think more importantly uh, is to find ways of encouraging young people to get into research so that we build a strong cohort right. uh, of right. researchers uh, of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nelomondo, quick one, half a minute. <laughs> I think my colleagues, Lynn and uh, McLean, covered me here. Yeah. The, the, the key part is to bring the private sector into, into the picture. Right. The same way that we work of the science engagement with the community, we have to do the similar kind of thing even with the private sectors and so on, because that's where some of the problems lie or some of the solutions come in. It's only when you then have this uh, combination of the three that we can actually find a better way of actually making a great impact. So maybe let me leave it here. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to you, uh, Prof. Mayegi. So, as a roundup, what would you like us, uh, where would you like to take us going forward? Uh, thanks, thanks, Tandy, and thanks, colleagues, for the insightful and informative uh, presentations. We have listened to three speakers who approached the aspect of research impact from different perspectives. And that is what we had indeed expected from this session. Um, we had uh, Professor Nelamondo who presented to us the NRF uh, framework for impact. And we then had Professor Morris who provided us with a very interesting and very topical aspect of a uh, case study on, on, on uh, um, COVID-19 and how it also relates to uh, HIV and AIDS. So I think that was really important. 
And of course, uh, 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 Dr. Sibanda, who approached it on the aspect of innovation. Thank you. So I think colleagues, what I can indicate that a, a research impact, as I indicated earlier, will continue to be a research priority for USAF research and innovation. Right, right. Yes, yes. Thank and you. Thank Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, colleagues. This has been really interesting and eye-opening, and I hope that we continue the conversations beyond this platform. Over to you, uh, Yusuf. Thank you very much.